Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new here, my name is Miranda and I am the Enchantress of Avalon. And for today's video, because it is Halloween, I decided I would just talk about five of my favorite gothic romance novels. So all of them have horror elements to them. Some are a little bit more, more romance, some are a little bit more gothic, but we're just going to discuss five that I feel are fabulous and really essential reading. So if you want to start out in gothic romance, but you're a little intimidated, these are five books that I think will definitely fit the bill. And uh, a couple of them are on the short side, so, or shorter, but they are in no particular order of how much I like them. I just actually put them in the pile according to publication because I felt that was easiest. So firstly, I just want to say, Happy Halloween and blessed Samhain to everyone out there. And let's get started on the books. The first essential gothic romance read. It's an obvious one, but Frankenstein. This is Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley's just incredible novel about the <clears throat> scientist, Victor Frankenstein, who creates a monster. Or, well, he's a creation. He wasn't necessarily always supposed to be a monster. He became one. He did monstrous things. But the real monster in this story to me was always Victor Frankenstein himself. He created another being and abandoned him. Of course, this being's going to want revenge on you. He was your creation. He was supposed to be your child. And you just left, so... It does definitely make you question who the real monster is out there. And for me, it's actually Victor himself. It's beautifully written and it's just an iconic novel. And I will be very honest, it's so different than any of the films. So if you've only known this by the films, I would encourage you to pick up this really awesome book. And plus, it, it's so fun that they were so shocked <laughs> back in 1818 that a 19-year-old woman wrote this book because they actually wanted to publish it under Percy's name because they didn't believe that Mary wrote it at first, which is kind of awesome. But her mother was a great feminist writer before the term feminism even existed. So Mary certainly had it in her blood. She actually only knew her mother from her writing because her mother passed away giving birth to her. So, the second essential gothic read is one of my all-time favorite books. It is my favorite novel of the Victorian period, my favorite novel of the entire 19th century, actually. So, yeah, if I would have to rank number one, it would probably be this guy, but it's still amazing. And I'm not giving favoritism, really. This is, of course, Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. And <clears throat> this is the story of Catherine and Heathcliff, who are young lovers, well, they're childhood best friends who become lovers in an um, innocent sense as they grow older. And then there's a bit of a love triangle in there with Edgar Linton and a lot of misunderstandings. There's pain, heartache, hauntings, cruelty. Both Catherine and Heathcliff can be incredibly cruel towards one another. And I find it actually utterly beautiful that Catherine would haunt him for 18 years after her death, that he would beg her to haunt him. And she did it. It's a very poignant book for anyone who has not read it. And it does definitely fit the gothic romance build because it is meant to be unsettling at times. It's meant to be a little confusing at times. And there's a lot in this. Even if you've read it before, I encourage people to read this one more than once. I read it probably about once a year and it means something new to me every time I read it. So that's number two. Number three, we're at the end, the ending years of the Victorian period by now, 
because we're in the 1890s with Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. Now, this is just a beautifully written novel. Oscar Wilde has a way with words, but it's also this very dark, very messed up tragic tale of vanity and what ultimate vanity will get you in the end and it's certainly very thought provoking oscar wilde was both vilifying and also celebrating the vein I think it's about a border on vanity. Like, you should be vain, but there is too much vanity. Too much vanity can wreck your soul. And that's what this book certainly is telling us. Book number four is Bram Stoker's Dracula. Of course it's on here. How could it not be on here? It is the most iconic vampire novel ever written. It is what really cemented vampires as being a favorite monster of literature. And it just gave birth to so many different adaptations. It gave birth to other novels who that were continuing the story. It gave birth to novels that were alternatively interpreting the story. It gave birth to just so many film adaptations and plays and usage of the characters in other formats. It's impossible to overstate just how important this one singular novel is to the whole of Gothic literature, to the whole of horror literature, and to the whole of supernatural literature. It's just so important. I don't think I need to talk much about the details. I have a video on Dracula and I'll definitely be making more videos on all of these books probably because they're all very important. But if you've only seen one of the movies, read the book. It's a bit dense for someone who's not accustomed to the format. It's an epistolary novel. It's written all in journal entries, di uh, journal entries, letters, and even some articles that were supposed to be in newspapers, which is a very, very interesting way to write a book. <laughs> and the style gets a moment, takes a minute to get, to get used to if you're not accustomed to it. But I promise if you just work through and read all the way through, there's so much here. It's such an incredible book. And also, it'll give you perspective on any of the film versions of Dracula, Dracula you've seen, and also maybe make you thirst for some other interpretations of the novel, you know, other books that are reinterpreting the novel. I've read many of them, and they run the gamut from amazing to really bad. But that's part of the fun of it, isn't it? It is in public domain now, so... Anyone can technically write about Dracula. And the final book, the fifth book on this Essential Gothic Reads list, actually is a little bit late. It's post the Victorian period, and it's post what most people consider Gothic, but it has all of the trappings of the great Gothic literature, and that is The Phantom of the Opera. Of course, I have to mention The Phantom of the Opera. I love The Phantom of the Opera as much as I love Wuthering Heights. Maybe. Possibly. Probably. <laughs> this was published in the early 20th century. 1910-1911, uh, depending on where and translations and such. The first English translation, I think, was 1910. I could be wrong on that. But it's incredible. And again, I feel it's fair to say both are favorites because that's the 19th century and we're into the 20th here. Yes. And also this is the only French novel on this list. Uh, I had 
two English, two Irish, and a French. Uh, that is authors. <laughs> because... Both Bram Stoker and Oscar Wilde were Irishmen who lived in England and wrote about England, but they were Irishmen. And obviously Emily Bronte and Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley were English women. So. I love this book. I think anyone who has any interest in the story, whether it's you liked one of the movies, you love the musical and I'm right there with you I adore the musical read the original book it's such a fun read and it has some elements that aren't necessarily in any of the translations there is no perfect version of this that was made on film um and I adore the musical and probably one of the best experiences you'll get cinematically is watching a recording of the actual musical being performed. As well as, I'm a huge fan of the Robert England film from the 1980s, but it changes so many elements and it gives it a slasher flick vibe, which I love. But it's another one that's just completely been open to interpretations and it's never been out of circulation in adaptation you have the fabulous silent film starring lon cheney from the 1920s you have musicals the andrew Lloyd weber one the one that we all love not the only musical version of phantom to exist there are others they flopped but they existed <laughs> And what else? Uh, obviously, more cinematic adaptations and just all these variants on it and tropes and um, young adult novels that gender bend it and have a female phantom. These all exist and they're all amazing. And like I said, with Dracula, some are well done, some are not well done, but they're all super fun because you get to go with the phantom sometimes. And yes, I am the person who wanted the Phantom with Christine. Yes, I wanted that. And every time I read it, I keep wishing there was one more chapter that Eric was alive and he and Christine got together and Raul could just go somewhere. I, I don't care. Or Eric can kill him. I'm okay with that. Just, I wish they were together. Just like, to be honest, I wish that Dracula and Nina made it work. And no, it's not just from the 1992 Francis Ford Coppola movie. I adore that movie. It's probably my favorite cinematic adaptation of Dracula. I know technically their love story isn't in the book. But I always read between the lines and I always said, I think it'd be really cool if Dracula and Mina got together. And I still do. I think it's way more interesting. And we have a lot of versions of this that have been rewritten that have Dracula and Mina together, just like we have a lot of versions that have Christine and the Phantom together. Because a lot of people like the bad boy trope. <laughs> and what's more bad than a little bit of a monstrous figure? So I've just talked about gothic literature for almost 15 minutes. So I'm going to close this video out. I want to thank you for watching today. Have a fabulous morbid and macabre Monday and a very, very happy Halloween. Bye now.